I featured these little low-profile LED floodlights on another video where uh, we analysed the circuitry and found it was multi-chip LEDs, very prone to failing, and the little chips that uh, run the LEDs directly from the mains by switching them in, in sections and also limiting the current seem to be prone to failure. And uh, in one of the modifications, I put a simple capacitive dropper in one just to run it at a low level, and it kind of worked. But I'm getting uh, more of these that are faulty, and this one's got a big sooty skid mark uh, around an LED, and when you power it up, it draws an impressive... Um, let's see, let's get this around to the power setting. It draws about 7.5 watts. It goes. It starts off higher and then goes down as those chips obviously heat up. The five LEDs that are lit just flicker and strobe, and it's very unpleasant. Um, so that's definitely gubbed. And I think we're going to see a lot more of these faulty floodlights because it just seems to be a, a design weakness in the perhaps the chips or the uh, design itself. And I thought, well, you know what? It would be interesting to design another circuit board that goes in here to replace these circuit boards that at least restores it to being a usable light. Now, my approach is not to go for this, you know, squeeze as much power out of the smallest case as possible. My approach would be to use a simple capacitive dropper, because it's the components that we can get easily, and use a through-hole circuit board, because, again, it's kind of easier to build with the through-hole circuit board, and it means we could use things like uh, ordinary 5mm LEDs, either, either the little straw hat LEDs or the focused ones, and that would make it very serviceable. That means that, you know, if a fault occurred, you could take the circuit board out and you could change some LEDs and you could just give it a new lease of life. So um, the circuit I'm going to use is not going to be a surprise. We're going to um, base it around the classic voltage multiplier. We're going to have live and neutral come in, live and neutral. Uh, this will be designed for universal voltage. It'll be either, it'll be 110 volt to 200 and let's say 250 volt whatever you your local voltage is you'll be able to adjust components so it's going to use the standard capacitive dropper and this is the main component that will vary according to your supply voltage and it's going to have a discharge resistor so that if you do put a plug in it you don't get a wee dingle when you unplug it the value of that will be you know it depends on your application uh, on the 240 volt sort of thing you'd be looking at 100 nano 220 nano. On 110 volt, you'd be looking at, say, probably starting about 390 nano, maybe 560 nano. You just experiment, you know, for the best result. And that will go through a bridge rectifier. Uh, there'll be an inrush limiting resistor, just because it's always a good idea. Not everybody uses it. I prefer to use it. It also acts as a fuse. A smoky, flamey fuse, but a fuse nonetheless. So that'd be AC in. Um, I'll also probably use discrete diodes for the rectifier. Because uh, there's loads there's loads of room on either end of this to actually put the circuitry. Uh, and then, maybe, optionally, a smoothing capacitor. I'm not going to put a discharge resistor across that one, just because, uh, I mean, I could. Nah. It's not going to be a terribly high voltage, because ultimately it's just going to be a chain of LEDs, and I'm not sure how many I'm going to be able to fit in. Um, I think I could... I'm not going to use the reflector. I'm just going to fit as many as I can fit comfortably in, while leaving good margin of clearance to the, the um, mountings, and also leaving room, good generous room for the circuitry. So it's going to be just a wee bit wider, about the same height as this array, but a wee bit wider perhaps. Um, I'll also allow uh, earth connection. I'll, I'll see when I design it. I'll see if I can uh, add a little earth connection on the PCB as well, or it could just be put onto one of the mounting positions. I'll also fix one of the more significant problems here, which is maybe part of their problem full stop, in the fact that their spacing of their holes is not correct for the, the housing, so they're only mounting the circuit board diagonally uh, with two fixings, and that might be causing distortion of the circuit board, not 100% sure. That may actually be limiting its ability to uh, couple the heat out. I'm not 100% sure. But this is what we're going to be using. Um, uh, I'm not 100% sure what it's going to look like until I've designed the circuit board. So I'm just going to design the circuit board and then we'll see how that works out. Oh, this capacitor here, the well, it depends on the number of uh, LEDs. I may just use uh, the standard 4.7 microfarad, 400 volt, but to be honest... Um, if it's a smallish number of LEDs that you could use, do what that, the LED lamps do and 
Just hope the LEDs don't go open circuit and use the lower voltage capacitor with a higher capacitance. Well, let's uh, say that's going to be one megohm as well. And that's going to be 1k or less. Yep, okay. Right, I'm going to design the circuit board and then we'll see which one we're going to use and then we'll make the circuit board up. Okay, I did uh, record um, some nice video, a uh, screen capture in the printed circuit board program and the video footage looks very nice, slightly boomy, but still very nice. Uh, and then I tried transferring it over to the iPad via Google Drive and various other techniques so I could blend it into this footage and make it all into one video. And Apple said no. So um, here it is in the form of bits of printed paper instead. <sighs> anyway, here's the first version of the design. And I, I got kind of uh, over-ambitious here. I used a, a footprint from another design for signage. And... Uh, it can accommodate the Superflux LEDs, the 4-pin Superflux LEDs, or it can accommodate the standard 2-pin LEDs, which means it could accommodate Superflux 3mm, 5mm, 8mm and 10mm LEDs. Super versatile. The slight downside to that was that uh, the, it meant it could fit in less LEDs. But the gist of the design, the actual outline here, which was a nice 3-inch by 2-inch, um, uh, the gist of it, I've, I've done another design, which I'll show you in a moment, but um, the basic layout is the same in both of them. And what I've done here is the LEDs are concentrated in the middle. The, I've used an earthing pad here, so you can actually take a, a lead on from the flex. You can take the, the neutral comes on and goes through these two uh, limiting resistors. I've chosen 30, 330 ohm resistors in this instance. Uh, it then goes to a discrete diode rectifier, simply because it gives better spacing with the individual diodes. And, you know, you've probably got uh, mains rated diodes knocking about. The live goes to the dropping capacitor, and to allow for all the different sizes, I put tons of pads in. And also, uh, I, instead of just using one discharge resistor to increase the voltage rating, I put two in series. And the earth pin from the flex goes onto this large pad. I had to mark a, bit, a section out because the raised circuit board actually gets in the way of the flex inlet. So that uh, is just marked out on the copper layer as well to actually just dremel out. It's just a, some little marks at the edge. And uh, that's fundamental. It's a very simple design. The, however, the Mark II uh, of this design, which happened already, uses 5mm LEDs, and it makes more sense, because look how many I can fit in. Whereas the previous design had 15 LEDs, this one has uh, 28. It's got 7x4. And that's also got the advantage that, um, whereas in the first version, because of the space I could only fit three rows in, it's, it zigzags through the LEDs in series, but it ended here with this track running underneath, which meant it compromised space for running the mains a track coming from the capacitive dropper, and took it a bit close to this... Uh, uh, support. In the second verse of the design, uh, because it's four rows, I could go zigzag backwards and forwards and it ended up at the same end, at the bridge rectifier end. And that means there's loads of room just free for this to keep it well away from these mounting posts. And that's fundamentally it. It's, uh, this, uh, it's a tricky decision. I'm not 100% sure if I'm going to go for this one or this one. I kind of prefer this one. But um, I'll make that decision uh, once I've thought about it, because I'm just about to etch one of these circuit boards and build it into the light. So, um, yes, we'll see We'll see which direction I go. So after a bit of deliberation, I decided to go with the 5mm LED arrangement because I can simply fit more in than the larger Superflux LEDs. I like the idea of being able to put Superflux or the 5mm LEDs on the same printed circuit board, but when it comes to the crunch, the, to make room for the superflux just took up too much space. It's actually, it let me fit in four rows of the 5mm LEDs, which let me all, it, it kept the separation of the tracks better as well, because the track can literally go along one row, back again, along, and then back again. That means the positive and negative feed to both ends of the LEDs are at this end. So I printed off the transparency. I used the silkscreen uh, industry transparency again. It's this translucent stuff, this milky stuff, um, that's got this squeaky surface and absorbs tons of the ink from the printer, particularly the dye-based ink. And to make sure I don't waste too much of this, because it is quite expensive and it's just, you know, I don't want to end up running out, what I did was I printed it out um, and then 
I simply got a bit, bit of this with the squeaky side up, placed it on what I printed out and put a bit of tape across uh, sellotape just to hold it on and then refed it through the printer and it printed out where it had pr already printed on the A4 sheet but this time it printed it uh, onto the, uh, the transparency with uh, the printer settings set to absolute maximum. So once I've done that I exposed the printed circuit board material. This is a photosensitive circuit board material that comes with a protective layer and above the copper it's basically it's a sheet of the circuit board laminate with the copper and then it's got the protective film uh, to protect a uh, light sensitive layer and uh, that uh, layer when it, where it's exposed to ultraviolet light it uh, breaks down so when you develop it in the uh, developer uh, sodium metasilicate if I remember correctly I'd have to double check that I always forget that name when you develop it, it, where it got exposed to ultraviolet, it comes off. So uh, that's what I've got here. And now I'm going to uh, etch it with ferric chloride. So I've got the ferric chloride down here. Here's my ferric chloride, which I've warmed up slightly just by placing it in a bath of water. I didn't microwave it this time, which was a bit of a disaster. I completely ruined my Sino GS etch system doing that. So this is actually a piece of lay flat tubing that I used the heat sealer to seal at one end. And later I thought, you don't even need to do that. You get these uh, fold round bag clips uh, on eBay in packs, rather bizarre. They supply them in packs of six, but only two of the six are the size you need to get a couple of packs. But um, it, I didn't need to do that because I could have actually just used another bag seal down at this end and just left it on. But as it is, I've got this lay flat tubing. Uh, I've got it sealed at this end. I'm going to place the circuit board in and then fold it over to seal it and slide this bag seal on. You just fold it over and then it slides across and makes a, a seal. Once I've done that, then I'm going to pull this one out to unleash the ferric chloride and then, hopefully not uh, flooding my bench with ferric chloride because that just made, makes a terrible stain then I'm just going to gently undulate it backwards and forwards. I'm not going to shake it too much because I don't want to burst this plastic bag and have the ferric chloride unleash everywhere. So I'm just going to undulate it uh, in the bag um, and until that's etched. And the fact it's warm should make it happen a bit faster, so I'll be back in a moment. Right, well that's it. Finished etching now, I think. So I'm going to slide the circuit board up to this end. Actually, I'm going to have to try and turn it sideways because it's an uh, end on at the moment. And I've completely overfilled this bag with uh, ferric chloride, which is the etchant. Oh, this, this isn't working too well. That's not much a surprise for this channel, really. Thing is going wrong. This is where I burst the bag and end up with ferric chloride all over the bench. And that'll add to further stainage. Let's see if I can uh, do it at that. Yeah, that's, that's looking pretty good. That's looking pretty good. So let's drain as much ferric chloride down to the other end as we can and squeeze it off and then I'll see if I can screw up putting this uh, bag clip on it uh, like I usually do. The idea is to trap all the ferric chloride down at the bottom of the bag uh, and keep a nice clean area at the top for loading the circuit boards in and also for rinsing it. So um, I'm just going to slide this across. That's kind of working. Excellent. So I've now got a little sealed portion here that I can remove this uh, and I'll take it through and give it a rinse under the tap and that keeps the ferric chloride away from the water and uh, lets me clean the circuit board so I'll be back in a moment. So that's it cleaned off now and it's ready to drill so before I do that uh, I'm going to have my my tea because it's the weekend and it's time to eat microwave rice served in the microwave container and a glass of white wine-like substance for peasants so I'll be back shortly. OK, tea has been eaten, it's time to drill all these holes out. So, uh, noise warning, I'm about to turn the drill on with a Tungsten Carbide bit 1mm I'm making at this time because I find that the, with 1mm holes the LEDs, they tend to seat down a lot better.
I have to say that when you're drilling thousands of holes, <coughs> it can be a bit fatiguing at times, but when you're drilling a small quantity like this, it's kind of therapeutic. You just kind of get engrossed in it, and uh, in the past when I was making batch of circuit boards up, I used to just put on some music and just get lost in the task, so to speak. The, when I first started making my own circuit boards, I did try using pillar drills, but it just took far too long. I find it so much easier uh, just doing it by hand, with a good quality hand drill. Not too many holes now. This time, the tiny little indents, the fact that I left a 0.5 millimeter uh, sort of indent in the pad has made it so much easier to line the drill up with them. It's so hard to get a good, uh, well aligned hole if there's nothing to help guide the drill. All it takes is that tiny little indent through the um, through the copper to actually help uh, the drill tip just sort of pop into position and just provide a nice central hole. You can feel it if you just skid about on the pad, you can feel it just drop into that hole perfectly. When I'm prototyping circuit boards, I'll make that hole uh, approximately 0.5mm in the pads, but then once the circuit design has been tested um, and it's going to manufacture, then I'll change the sizes so that the uh, NC file that the Finder Circuit Board package produces for the Finder Circuit Board manufacturer uh, does accurately represent the size of the hole. So just a few more holes left. And that looks about it. Yeah, and once again, when you turn it over and you look from the back, you can instantly see if you've missed any holes or misdrilled them in any way because they, they really stick out like a sore thumb on the other side of the surface. But yep, that's uh, looking good. So now I'm going to take the drill bit out because I always do that because uh, otherwise if I ever drop the drill, as sometimes happens, it will break the drill bit almost guaranteed. It's just too easy to break those tungsten carbide bits. So, before I start populating with this with components, I'm going to bring up the guillotine, or shear, and I'm just going to pop the material in and slice it. This just saves so much time versus uh, trying to cut it in other ways. It's just one of the best ways to cut the material. Another punch I've got somewhere. I don't know if I've got it over here at the moment. Um, Oop, is a corner rounding punch. I completely messed that bit up there. And the corner rounding punch just uh, basically takes the sharp corners off and it... Oop. And it rounds the ends, the edges. I'm pretty sure it is somewhere over here. I'm not 100% sure where though. I found in the past when you're dealing with Chinese printed circuit board manufacturers, they can sometimes try and guillotine your circuit boards and it leaves a very rough edge um, and to avoid that uh, when I'm sending a printed circuit board for a manufacturer I will as part of the printed circuit board outline make it a rounded edge by basically the outline I'll drop a circle uh, in track form there and then just remove segments of the track just to create a round end and that means then they have to route it out and you get a nice clean edge to the circuit board. So that's uh, this ready for assembly now so I'm going to get the uh, jig, clean this bench off and then we'll stick some components in it. So I've increased the size of the corner mounting holes which are going to have M3 hardware going through them uh, so I've made them 3.5mm to allow for a bit of play and I stuck it into the base and actually tried and it does does actually fit which is nice. I drilled these out 2mm hole, the ones for the flex to go into and kind of regretted that a slight, yeah I wish I'd gone 1.5mm, it's kind of big but it doesn't matter, it's fine. 
And I also used the Dremel with a sounding uh, drum on it just to uh, just buff that out a little bit because that's going to be where the flex comes in. And because the circuit board's raised a little bit, it, that's basically where the, the cores of the flex are coming out. So it's just to make way for them. So I've adjusted my frame, noting that, uh, that I've got all these marks in the assembly frame from the fairground controller days. I actually marked with the names of the control panels from the fairground uh, light controllers, which is just nice. Um, so I'm just going to clip this circuit board in, like that. And I've got the, I printed off the uh, screen print effectively in the outline just to remind me where the components are going because obviously because it's a handmade board it's not got this uh, screen print on it. So I've got the components. I'm going to add a capacitor. I hope, I hope this is a 4 point, yeah, 4 point 7 mag fired 400 volt capacitor. I'm going to use a 220 nano fired capacitor. Probably end up making it bigger than that then, but that's, that's a good start. Uh, so I've got LEDs, resistors, diodes, I've got my crispy sugar coated mm, chocolate minstrels, I've got my sort of white wine type substance. I'm all set, so let's uh, start making this. Oh, and for trimming the leads I've got my Xeron snips. Not the Chinese copy Xeron snips, but an actual pair of Xeron um, cutters. So. Um, uh, when I had my rant about these, uh, someone mentioned to Zeron that I'd had a rant about the Chinese copy and how it really annoyed me that they supplied it in the packaging. That, you know, it wasn't just a, a just a simple copy. They'd actually tried to present it as the original product. So Zeron sent me some of their snips to try, which is uh, good. That's going to be interesting. I can already feel that compared to the other ones, these are a lot lighter and nicer to actually squeeze. They've got the flat surface to... Uh, press uh, as opposed to this uh, dip moulded surface and they actually feel physically lighter. It's quite neat, uh, it's quite interesting to see what that's like. Another thing, Zuron make a, a point of their blades don't touch, they overlap slightly which results in a much flatter cut to the components. I'm looking forward to seeing how, how that works. Anyway, onward, let's uh, start sticking the components in. I'm not going to punish you by making you watch me put every single LED in. So, um, Oh, he said munching chocolate. Uh, so I'll just put uh, the basic components in. So when using this assembly frame, uh, you start off by putting the lowest components first. So these are the diodes that are forming the bridge rectifier. It's a discrete bridge rectifier made from four separate diodes just because it's, uh, you know, I could have used a bridge rectifier, but, uh, you know, the, in one package, but it's just nice that you can make out of discrete components. It also, um, oop, he, he fumbled. Also with the, this is a, another slight problem with uh, the circuit boards being quite close to the edge of the uh, assembly uh, jig. Uh, sometimes it uh, makes it hard to hold the components. They tend to, because you're gripping them between your big fat industrialized fingers, they sort of pop out. So um, I was saying something there. Yeah, the discrete, uh, if I'd used this standard bridge rectifier, I think the pin spacing is often just a wee bit too close. With the sta with the discrete diodes, I can control the pin spacing, basically. So I'm using two 330 ohm resistors as the inrush current limiter, just because, well, it's just an arbitrary value that came to mind. So orange, orange, brown, 3, 3, and 1, which means 3, 3, and 1, 0, which gives 330 ohms. I've got two of those. I put two in series just to spread the dissipation. This light isn't designed for operating at very high power, so it's not that critical. The value of those, uh, it, you know, as long as they're below the total of about 1k, it's fine. Uh, the discharge resistors cross capacitor, I'm using two 1 mega ohm resistors, so that's brown, black, green, 1, 0, and 5 zeros. And I'm using two in series because uh, that they're theoretically rated 250 volt DC voltage, so on our main supply, we'd be exceeding it to, to a degree by uh, operating them across our peak 330 volts, although there is the drop of the LEDs across that, but, but you know, I can't, there's space inside, I might as well use two of the, the resistors in series. So I'll get the foam pad. I've also uh, used acetone to remove the... Uh, the uh, exposure, the, the resist, the photoresist, uh, now that it's all done its job and the circuit board's etched, 
You can leave it on and it will kind of just melt out the way as you solder. But um, I thought it'd be nice just to clean it off. So let's uh, start soldering. Using my favourite bit uh, on these solder irons, which is the 3 three millimetre, I think it's 3.2 do they call it? It's the 3 millimetre, but it's the angled bit and uh, it's a good compromise. It, it's good for through whole components and the larger size gives it better thermal mass. It's just a, it makes a, I, I've just always kind of preferred it. Probably because I kind of grew up using an Antex soldering iron, which was this a default bit. Onto the bridge rectifier. This uh, circuit board, there's not really a huge amount to it. It goes together quite quickly. Lead-based solder, obviously. Um, there seems to be this thing that, you know, lead-based solder was banned because it's toxic. It's not. I don't know MD who's died from lead poisoning from using soldering or, or even working on lead roofs or anything like that. It's all just been blown a bit out of proportion. Uh, in fact, most people in the electronic industry I know who have retired are quite ripe old ages. You know, they're in their sort of 70s and 80s, and I'm thinking, well, gee, lead didn't do them any harm. So let's, uh, now I've soldered the small discrete components, let's pop them out and test these for the first time. I've not actually tried these yet. Test the Zeron snips. Nice light feel. Yeah, they're quite nice. And American made, genuinely American made, which is kind of pleasing actually. It's nice uh, when you get uh, devices that are made in, in places like Britain, America, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, you know, and, and uh, European countries. It's just uh, kind of pleasing that, you know, it's not all dominated by China. So now, uh, I'm coming on to the LEDs and this is where I will just pause momentarily because uh, there's lots of LEDs to solder in, and it will be very time-consuming. Um, so I shall pause now until I put these in. I should mention that I was choosing a colour and the focus type, and I had the choice of the 5mm focused uh, warm white, which would have projected a nice beam, or the flat top, the straw hat warm white, which projects a wash of light, or pink. And, well, you can guess that I chose just the hell of it. Uh, this is going to be a pink wash floodlight, so um, I'll be back in a moment once I've soldered these in. Looking quite neat so far, I have to say. It looks quite smart indeed. So, last few components. The capacitor, which I'm just going to double check the polarity here, because that would just be... that would be amusing if I stuck the capacitor in the wrong way around. And as soon as the light was plugged in, it just went... it lit pink briefly and then detonated forcibly, blowing the glass out. That'd be kind of amusing, unless it got smacked in the face by broken glass, which wouldn't be quite so amusing. I'm not sure uh, what uh, potential there is for uh, an electrolytic capacitor blowing in, up inside one of these cases to actually break the glass. I'm not really sure. Now, the capacitor, which is a 400 volt, 220 nanofarad capacitor, said Clive, surreptitiously checking it was, uh, goes in, I put, you know, plenty of holes for different sized components, so that, that can go, I'll probably just put that down there then. That looks reasonable enough, and leave it just sticking up a tiny bit proud, just to take the stress off the leads. So I'll just nudge that back, and then try and hold it slightly hovering underneath the circuit board while I solder it. There we go. because I may have to bend this uh, capacitor back a little bit anyway just to fit in the case, although having said that, it's not a huge capacitor. This is the drop capacitor. This lets a small portion of current through in each half of the sine wave, thus limiting the current through the LEDs. I Just out of interest, uh, I looked at the cut ends with a uh, magnifying glass, and Xeron are right, it, it produces a really flat top to the components, it's quite odd, when, it's particularly when you're used to looking at the sharp uh, component tops, it would really snag your fingers. Because uh, with the normal um, Chinese generic snips, it produces a pointy top. Uh, with these overlapping blades, it, it makes it very flush, it's quite neat. So um, we're just about there, 
so I've got the floodlight case. I'm going to try it, try it before I put it in. It seems like a good idea. So I've got these cables all suspiciously cropped to roughly the right length. So I'll put them in like this. There's the neutral. Solder. And I should have used thicker bit of solder for this, but not to worry. It's done. That's quite a large course. I'll use my cheapy Chinese snips for that one because I don't want to use my precious, my precious Xeron snips for that. Then comes the earth connection, which is actually going to the uh, mounting pad for connection to the case with a conductive spacer. Noting that the worst electric shock I ever received in my life was indeed from a case with a conductive uh, spacer which had just been left out. Uh, so the case wasn't earthed and the company that uh, had serviced it also left most of the plastic spacers out that keep the circuit board away from the metal case. So, yeah, that was interesting. Fortunately, there's no debate at the time because I was in the middle of a frickin' supermarket in front of lots of people. Yeah, that was embarrassing. It's not a case of get a little shock and look around and see if MD saw you. It was, yeah, yeah, everybody saw you. Yep, mm-hmm. Yes, it was really obvious, particularly the bang and the flash that followed it. Yeah, let's try and forget that incident. A full-on uh, current across the chest incident. I felt it go right across. It was, uh, it was exciting, uh, particularly from an earth metal case that was not supposed to be live under any sort of possible way. It just... It was a, a learning experience. Right, so we're ready to pair this up and it's going to do one of two things. Well, one of three things. It may not work at all. It may light up or it may go bang. Many of you are evil enough to want it to go bang and part of me says that would be hilarious as well. I have had prototypes uh, go bang quite forcibly when they've been powered up and it usually makes me laugh when it happens uh, it's a bit annoying I will say but um, it happens from time to time so here we go let's get the quick test and uh, hook these leads up not an awful lot of point connecting the earth lead it's not doing anything yet but it will once that's put together and I shall plug this in, and we shall see if we're getting pink. Uh, before I even close that lid over, I'm just going to do a quick double check. Uh huh, uh, through that, through that, mm hmm, mm hmm, yes, yes, that, that'll do. And, da da! Oh, one LED out. There's a very good chance to put that in back to front, and that's why it's out. Oh well, that'll be completely dead now, but I can change that LED. It's not super bright. Let's get the meter into this. I think I'm going to have to increase the value of that capacitor dramatically, uh, making sure that doesn't go too close to any component leads, to make that brighter. So um, let's. Uh, this thing is going to only going to be rated about a watt. It's it, actually it's 1.5 watt with a current through the LEDs of 16 milliamps. So that is actually quite acceptable. It's just trying to compete with. Uh, these uh, lights overhead that's making it, uh, I mean, it's quite bright. It looks bright enough. Little bit of shimmer, even that capacitor, but that's because the uh, iPad's picking that shimmer up. Um, it's not really that, um, I'm not getting any visible shimmer at all. So um, it's just the iPad's being quite finickety. Yes. So I'm going to change that LED that's duff. I'm going to get a Sharpie and I'm just going to put a wee dot in that one. Just to remind me where it is. It's that one. So I'm going to change that LED. And then I'm going to put it into the case and then we'll try it in the case. Okay, things worthy of note. Uh, the putting the spacers in is a nightmare, really, because I had to use two spacers. I wanted to give it good separation from the back. And also because I originally intended to use a nut, a slightly outsized nut, maybe four millimetres, so that the uh, three millimetre screw passed through the nut, 
and it basically acted as a metal spacer uh, to clamp the to bond the thing onto the case. Instead, I had to use a stack of washers to match the plastic spacers I used. Uh, I could probably mount it further back. I just wanted to give good clearance at the back, and equally, I could have just put a piece of you know tape across the back just in case anything did ever bridge like water get into the case or anything like that or, or even a tiny bit of swerf went down the back and bridged an LED onto the back of the metal case which is well earth through this screw but um, yeah putting the spacers in was a bit footry but uh, the other option is to use the little hexagonal spacers the ones that you screw in and then you could put a, an ordinary screw in the front into the hexagonal spacer for them all however that's that done so let's uh, get the glass on with its seal there already no reflector because there's really not uh, room for the reflector and also the reflector would kind of well the reflector just would actually just uh, mask off the central area I kind of prefer it just this way particularly given it's a sort of wash light and even if it wasn't it was the uh, focused LEDs the reflector still isn't really necessary it means I can fit a lot more LEDs in like this so um, yes that's uh, what the, the finished thing looks like fundamentally which is quite smart I like the fact you can see the components in it um, I'll turn this light off and uh, zoom in a wee bit intensity wise. Is this going to let me do that? Yes it is. So uh, yes, it's not bad. It puts out a modest wash of light. It's not it's not going to it's not going to be good for working under or anything like that, but it is good just as a general low level illumination that you could quite happily leave on twenty four seven just as a sort of um, general illumination for finding your path, you know, finding your way through an area. So uh, just low level illumination, it's, it's simple, yeah, if, if the LEDs fail you could just open up and change them and it's just repurposing the case in, in an interesting way. So um, it's quite nice, uh, yeah it's, it's turned out okay, I quite like the fact you can see all the electronics inside, it gives it a very sort of three dimensional sort of look. So yeah, good result, I quite enjoyed that project.